Welcome back to Byro Sports Talk. I am your host, Byro. Uh, introductions again. I'm here. <laughs> and just the text message I got. I am currently, once again, recording. I know some of you might think that might not be the best, but for doing what I want to do, having these graphics, having making sure th items are up to standards to my liking for you, I just want to bring you the best quality I can through my graphic designs and all sorts of just at post editing basically. Making sure everything is up to snub and making sure I give out a great quality product that way. So moving on. So some quick hits before I just dive on to some in-depth topics. First thing that happened today, just recently, today's Monday, uh, the Panthers decided to fire GM Dave Gettleman. Uh, he was part of their Super Bowl team when they made it to the Super Bowl against Peyton Manning's Bron Broncos. Uh, the owner decided a change was needed, and I guess we'll see what that change may be here coming up soon. Uh, some people might question why in July that was the case. Uh, again, it doesn't matter when you do it, sometimes a change just needs to happen. And one of those situations happened to Ohio State where they waited till after the season, hoping that Thad Mata could get a few more recruits, and they didn't. So they decided to fire Thad Mata. So on that note, we're looking at a similar situation, similar, they're just gonna look for a new GM. Cam Newton's still there. They're vamping up the offense, trying to solidify some defensive players, even if they are old, getting them in rotation. The Panthers will look nice this coming season. Just gotta execute in games. Uh, another big news this weekend was Roger Federer winning the Wimbledon, his 19th Grand Slam title. Uh, some stats about that. He's the winningest tennis player of all time. And he used to be best friends with Tiger Woods when they were both up and up. I don't know if they still talk or anything like that. Uh, some other stats I have. Active Slam winners. So what I mean by Slam winners is they won the French, the Australian, the Wimbledon, and the U.S. Open. Uh, Novak Djokovic, who I believe was in the semis. Uh, Rafael Nadal, I can't remember when he was eliminated. Uh, and Roger Federer. Now, another key stat with this win was this is his eighth Wimbledon. Now... That broke a record of how many Wimbledon wins you've had. And eight out of nineteen, that's a lot. He's won out of the out of three different opens. So the US Open, Australian Open, French Open. He's won eleven titles amongst all three, but he's won eight at Wimbledon. So that's a huge portion of your totals. Now, some career totals I wanted to list and how old they are. Out of these three active Grand Slam winners, Roger Federer, of course, the all-time leader, he's at the age of 35, and he's got 19. Rafael Nadal is at second with 15, and he's 31, but he's also getting injured a lot now. And then you look at Novak Djokovic, who just recently started winning, and he's got 12 which is, if I'm not mistaken, probably fifth, somewhere in that range, tied with a whole bunch of others. And he, uh, he's the youngest of the three at 30. Now for Novak, it's been, how do I get back to the finals? For Nadal, it's, can I stay healthy enough to make it back to the finals? Federer, even with the Wimbledon, it's been, how do I overcome the finals? Because no, for 
Roger Federer, he was in 2014-2015 in the finals at Wimbledon and lost to Novak Djokovic. Last year he got injured and basically took the year off, Roger Federer did, or took some time off just to heal after injuring himself. And I believe it was his left knee. Uh, other Wimbledon news, you're looking at Venus Williams trying to get back and unfortunately she lost in two straight sets. So no cha no Grand Slam for her. It's just great seeing one of the Williams sisters still performing great since most of us Americans <laughs> try to root for the Americans. Uh, this year there was an American in the semis. He just didn't pull it out. Looking on, moving on to the next little minor topic. We're talking the D-League, or not the D-League, sorry, the Summer League for basketball. Tonight, the Lakers play the Trailblazers for the finals. The Lakers have been impressive. Lonzo Ball has been after... Seems like a week ago, I was talking about how terrible he performed. He's been doing triple doubles. He's been getting double doubles. He did have an injury last night, but I think he'll be fine to play tonight. I'm more impressed with how well this Lakers team has been doing in summer league. You don't normally see it translate to the season, but they're just doing all the right things. They're getting the right free agents. And quite frankly, they're trying to build to win. Some other news, Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor. I believe we brought it up before, but now it's becoming more and more relevant. Uh, the pay-per-view is going to be 90 bucks. I'm still intrigued. A lot of people view this as Floyd Mayweather getting his 50th win easy. Personally. I look at it as it could be good. Floyd's always been more of a, I'm going to hit you and then win each round. I'm not going to knock you out. Conor McGregor, if he comes out trying to knock out Floyd Mayweather, let alone if he has the endurance to keep going round after round after round, trying to pound and pound and pound, I could see an upset. But my prediction personally Floyd Mayweather gets his 50th. He's not going to knock out Conor McGregor. That's not his game. I think it's going to be that way. He's just going to land his punches, and we'll see what happens. Uh, another news. I know I'm going to have a NFL segment later, but Zeke or Ezekiel Elliott was caught up in an incident at a Dallas bar recently. And what does that mean for Zeke? Can he stay on the field? Well, with the domestic violence charges and then having him dropped, the NFL is still looking into that alone. You're looking at a kid who was very promising as a rookie, but already has two off-field issues within half a year, really. And it's kind of sad looking at it that way. That kid with such a promising, promising future has that issue right now. However, I will go ahead and say he's probably going to get around four to six, four to eight game suspension. It's a first time offense. I think he would have been stuck with four with just the domestic violence. But with this building on, they're going to try to push more. And I'm sure he'll appeal and try, it will be reduced to four. With that, <clears throat> let's talk about the NBA. So with the NBA, there's been a few more signings. I know we talked about the Summer League. I also just would like to talk about some other things. So let's talk about the signings first. Rajon Rondo is going to the Pelicans. I think that's great. That allows Drew Holiday to move over to shooting guard if he wants to. And Rondo will find everyone. And one of his best seasons assist-wise was when he was with the Kings. And 
I wonder who was on that team with the Kings. Oh yeah, DeMarcus Cousins, who's with Anthony Davis now. And with those two bigs, I'm sure Rajon Rondo will help excel this team. Jonathan Simmons, don't know much. He was a Spurs backup. Uh, he's signed to the Magic. I'm not going to go too in-depth with him. Ersan Ilyasova, re-signed with the Hawks. Um, great sh use. I want to say a great shooter, but I think he's more a good shooter. Uh, he's going to have to play a big role with them with Millsap leaving, Dwight Howard being tra traded, and with Schroeder and Tim Hardaway Jr. Well, Tim Hardaway Jr. is now with the Knicks. But Schroeder, uh, Kent Bazemore leading the way as guards. Ilya Silva is going to have to help step up small forward position or power forward. He's a forward. And we'll see how that translates over. Uh, Jonas Arebko signed with the Jazz along with Thabo Cephalosha, both great role players. Jarebko is a great forward. Uh, Cephalosha is a great two to three or shooting guard small forward for some of you out there. I think it's just trying to fill the void of Gordon Hayward and seeing what you can do. It, it's great signings, it's just I think they still lose some of their wins. These two guys aren't going to be that different ma difference maker like Gordon Hayward was. Contavious Caldwell-Pope signed with the Lakers. Great, great for the Lakers. He was a solid player for the Pistons. He likes the future of the Lakers. So thus, you see this signing. Uh, another signing, Dwayne Dedman to the Hawks. Another Hawks signing uh, with Dwight Howard gone and Paul Millsap. It's great. He was a backup for the Spurs and was solid. Ron Baker to the Knicks. I know I mentioned this last week, but with the developments of the Knicks, they exceeded cap for, oh, I can't remember who, I want to say Derrick Rose, but Derrick Rose is visiting the Bucks currently and other teams, seeing where he's going to go. <laughs> so Ron Baker to the Knicks again, they re-signed him to a cheaper deal. Uh, Alan Baines to the Suns, not much to talk about there, it's a role player going to the Suns. Uh, <clears throat> and another one, Luke Mba Amute, going to the Rockets, which if you go by NBA 2K17, he's a shooter, but typically he's been a great defender. Um, if you take both of those into consideration, he's a great 3 and D player, meaning he can, he's a spot-up shooter, but defensively he will shut you down. Uh, last topic for the NBA before... Moving on, we're going to talk about the ever-changing Lonzo Ball situation in the summer league. So what happened was early on when he was struggling a little bit, he was wearing his big baller brand shoes. Now, lately, he's been changing the shoes he's been wearing each and every game. Wearing Jordans, wearing Adidas, wearing a Nike, wearing... Uh, Under Armour. Now, you look at those, you're like, Jordan and Nikes, aren't they the same brand? Technically, yes. Nike owns the Jordan brand. However, when you look at it from a, hey, a, consumer standpoint, a consumer standpoint, Jordan's a brand, Nike's a brand, uh, Under Armour, and Adidas. Yes, there's more. There's a lot more. Uh, Clay Thompson's signed by some random Chinese shoe company that I've never heard of over here in the States. Um, I'm surprised Converse isn't big. Shaq had his own brand with Adidas. I That's a good question. I'm going to look that up real quick. However, uh, the shoe brands have always been a big focal point for incoming players, especially just, yes, Reebok is who Shaq was with. Now, 
Shoe Brands is big for the player because ever since Michael, everyone wanted to be like Mike. Everyone wanted their own shoe. Kobe had his own shoe. Uh, Stefan Marbury tried to do the big baller route and make Starburys. Uh, Under Armour has been big because Steph Curry was disrespected by Nike and decided to sign with on Under Armour. Ken Bazemore is an Under Armour. Uh, looking around the league, you see Nike, Jordans, Adidas, Under Armour. You see it all. And it all depends on how you are. Derrick Rose's shoes used to be high tops. And I understand because with his injuries, high tops are great because of ankle injuries. I wish more shoes were high tops when I was playing, so I didn't have the ankle in injuries. But Lonzo Ball's been wearing these shoes back to bring it full circle. He's been wearing these shoes because his dad's trying to get him a actual contract with a shoe company. I, in all honesty, I think it's a he wants a shoe company to buy out big baller brands and make it like a Jordan brand. I don't think that's going to be the case. It's good. It's kind of hard to see that. Uh, and essentially, it's been free advertisements for other companies with Lonzo Ball just balling out in their shoes. Uh, you look at it, you think, what can I do different? What? How can we get this kid a done deal? And according to Lavar, you need the right amount of money. So this will be developing. I'm sure it will be talked about over and over again. But as for the NBA, that's all I got right now. So let's move on to the NFL. Only a few things in the NFL. Uh, besides Johnny Manziel getting some interest from a few teams. I uh, just want to throw that out there. Cody Lattimore was pepper sprayed last December. Uh, he's a Broncos wide receiver. He was in Dayton, Ohio at a strip club getting pepper sprayed by a bouncer for not cooperating. Uh, pretty much, if this becomes anything, it'll be, a, I'm sure, a short suspension or even a fine. It doesn't sound like a big deal, only because nothing happened. He didn't like punch a dude out or anything like that. He was just pepper sprayed. Now, this next topic, I know I talked about Lonzo, and this is all about a feud that might be developing, but J.J. Watt called out Big Baller Brand during the release of the J.J. Twos, I believe is what they're called. $100 shoes with J.J. Watt as the representative. He tweeted out $400 less than some shoes on the market, and I actually wear them, calling out Lonzo for not wearing his shoe during the summer league. This is huge. This is a big deal only because when you want to wear someone's shoes, you expect them to wear them. Now, JJ wears his shoes, and I hope you guys enjoy some of the pictures I'm adding. I'm... I have to agree with JJ on this one. If you're going to fully go big baller brand, you should be wearing their shoes. I know I could see it being LeVar wants Lonzo to wear big baller brands. Lonzo comes up and says, you know, I don't like these shoes, Dad. I can't wear something I don't like or can perform in. So and then he put, he wears all these other shoes to try to get a different deal. Is this the beginning of the end for the big baller brand? I don't know. Is it the end of Lonzo's own shoe company? I don't know. It's technically not even Lonzo's. It's LeBar's. And with LiAngelo getting a Ferrari, of all things, it's going to be surprising what happens. Now, just back to the J.J. Watt situation. It will be nice to see what he does this year in the JJ2s. Now, JJ2s are more 
a walking shoe. I'll add another picture here. Uh, you look at it, it looks very comfortable. Now, I personally do like what the Big Baller brand shoes look like. I do not like the price tag. They are way too high of a price tag. Now, it could just be LeVar's prerogative for that. And it could be a number of things. But the fact that we're talking about LeVar Ball in my NFL segment is hilarious. Other things to talk about in the NFL. Uh, it is mid-July. I... For fantasy football, just to talk it out with you guys, I don't know how much of it I will talk about. I will probably update you guys in some of my league or update some of you for some of my leagues as they happen. Uh, again, I would love to do some live things. I just need to hear from you guys. I personally, I'm not doing it because. If no one's going to want to ask questions, say they want to ask questions, I'm not going to give you an opportunity that way to ask questions. Uh, to put it out there, I there's more than one way to do a podcast. And quite frankly, the way I chose was so that I can em emphasize the video aspect while still providing a SoundCloud podcast. Now, I know I don't really hear much from some of you. I do know from the, so the few that, hey, this white wall behind me is a little dull, a little boring. I understand. Uh, as this, once again, at the house that I live at, once we get more and more done, that'll change. I... I will probably look into fixing that, not for this recording, but for the next recording. And by fixing it, I might see what... I know I do have software where I can edit this easily. However, that's not the software I've been using due to time and trying to manage everything. So, once again, if you guys, as patient as you are, I appreciate it. But just... Keep working with me. I keep working for you. We will get through the, of course, the initial bumpy road. That is a start to a podcast. Um, again, for the NFL, I'm moving on. I uh, just want to shout out again to Schmoogle. I'll put their link again in the description. Uh, for those who weren't listening to the last podcast, they are a group... Schmoogle House Productions. They are on Facebook and they're also on YouTube. They are bringing a Nightwing uh, episodic show to YouTube. Um, I don't know much only because I only know what my cousin told me. If you don't remember, he was the WWE expert I had on last week. Um, again, he... It's, it's great. I will keep plugging for them. I hope they appreciate the support and don't mind continue helping me out too. Uh, I would like to also mention thank you for the shares last week. I know John Roger Price, he shared it. I know Zach Taylor shared it. And of course, Diego Palacios shared it. And I, all I can say is thank you guys. I appreciate the support. I appreciate just everything you guys do for me as I try to keep doing what I can. <laughs> so, on that note, let's move on to college sports. Let's start with the NCAA. So, the big topic this week was there was an NCAA meeting in Alabama don't even remember if it is was this last week, but uh, it was last week because I listened to it on the way to, I had a conference this week, so I had to go there for leadership training. Um, but the, the meeting had a little focus on 
a very strong topic. I will probably go in a little depth with this topic for this. So a few years ago, the NCAA got rid of the bowl championship series, which was just one championship game, no playoffs, no nothing. They got rid of it, and they went to a 14 format. Now, every year so far there's been, well, this team deserved it, this team deserved it, this team deserved it. And quite frankly, it's usually about two teams. Now, no matter how many teams you get involved, it's going to become, I want to say there will always be controversy, but the ideas I've heard from others make a lot of sense. So this is the idea. Let's make it eight teams and you have your Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, SEC, and I'm pretty sure they're talking the American as the fifth team. And of course that leaves three at larges and personally, that seems a little cheating still to me. And I'm not cheating like, oh my goodness, like this is rigged, but I would like to see the Mac, the Sun Belt, and the Mountain West get some representation there too. Is that fair? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But let's talk about this. So those are three, the three at-larges are a must. It's, you gotta have them. And I understand the five automatic qualifiers. You gotta have them. The thing I don't like is the small schools don't have a right. And technically Notre Dame, with their success, they haven't quite pulled it off yet. So what does that mean? Well, in the bowl system, Notre Dame automatically qualified if they were in the top five, I think it was, or 12, for a bowl game. The little schools would get one representative, and you'd be lucky if you got more than just the one representative. Um, the big schools back then was the Big East, the, Mac, or the Big Ten, the Big 12, the SEC, and Pac-10 before they moved to 12. So you still had those five. Again, I understand you want those five, but when I look at it, the Mac deserves a shot. The Mountain West especially deserves a shot with Boise State always being a threat. And I think, I want to say the Sun Belt deserves it. Conference USA deserves it. That's just... I, I think everyone deserves a shot, honestly. So how do we fix this? Well, this is how I would fix it. You have your Big Ten, you have your Big 12, you have your SEC, and you have your Pac-12. That fifth one, as rumors go, the highest non-Power 4 conference champion, which sadly will probably be an American team all the time. May not. It's possible that an American team doesn't make it. For example, Louisville had a shot and didn't win it. So there's a chance for, like, say, a Western Michigan to get in or a Boise State if they don't lose a game. That would be how I would do the top five and then the three at larges. Do I like the eight number? I do. I think the eight number is spectacular. It would justify the five and sixes that just miss out. And I say that because when you look at the top five or six, you can justify all those. Very rarely does the seventh team seem like they belong. And I say that because you look at the seventh team, they're usually not as good. But let's take a look at the last season. So let me pull it up here and look at the 
college football standings. Now, I know some of you would love to see a NCAA like basketball version. But let's let me finish with the rankings. So we're looking at these rankings. We're seeing Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Washington. Those were your top five. Or four, sorry. Then you had Penn State, Michigan, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Southern California. So right there is nine teams that were big. If you want to add in Colorado at 10, that's fine too. But looking at this, Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, Washington. Penn State had the argument of, we won our conference. We deserve to be in. And Michigan was just... I mean, they were there because they're Michigan. They're usually decent, but they lost to Ohio State. I look at this. You could, Last year specifically, all the way through the top 10, those were a solid 10. Colorado was pretty good. Southern California was pretty good. Wisconsin was always decent. But Penn State, Michigan... Oklahoma bounced back great after losing early. But I look at it, you look at the teams that are through 11 and 25, you see the Western Michigans, you see Louisville, you see, I see at the bottom, a Temple, a Navy. I mean, it's not like it's it can't happen. If we look at the standings from last year, for football. Clemson won the ACC. Move on to the American. Navy won the American. Well, scratch that. I think, did South Florida win the American? Let me, let me look up a different site. Now, I just want to bring you guys the most accurate answer. Now. <laughs> it just, it just shows, brings me back to the same exact spot. Now, Oklahoma definitely won. Penn State won for the Big Ten. I do remember that one. Conference USA was Western Kentucky. Your best independent was Brigham Young. The MAC was Western Michigan all the way. They beat Ohio. Uh, I can't remember if it was Boise or San Diego State. I know Washington beat Colorado. I'm looking at the SEC, which was Bama. And the Sun Belt... Again, I don't know if it was Arkansas State or Appalachian State. But, like I said, I would rather bring you more accurate information. College football. Sorry, guys. I tend to zone out. I tend to do just run things in my mind, not actually say them. So I'm just trying to, once again, trying to bring you the most accurate information, trying to bring you who won what. Let's see, the Sun Belt. This looks like, it says college football, but again, it's, it's shown me Appalachian State. It's, uh, it's for some reason I'm having an issue trying to find each of these in which conference finished 2000. It's not what I'm looking for. I just, once again, I'm just trying to find who won which conference outright. Some I remember, some not quite following. But as I was saying, 
Eight teams seems to be the right number. You need just some more at-larges. So like three teams last year would have been Penn State, Michigan, Oklahoma. Uh, would I think Michigan deserve it? Biasly, no. Unbiased, I guess so. I think a more deserving team would have been a Colorado or something, but that's without me in-depth looking at both their schedules and still leaning a little bit biasly. Now, if I look at their schedule, Michigan last year, to try to justify their wins, I see they destroyed Hawaii. They destroyed UCF. I guess beating Colorado, thus giving them the edge over them. But that the next team after Oklahoma would have been USC. So USC football schedule for last year. We're looking at Sam Darnold starting late for them, but a blowout loss to Bama, easily beating Utah State, losing 27-10 to to Stanford, barely losing to Utah. Sam Darnold starts, hasn't lost then. They just destroyed, they won against Arizona State, they beat Colorado, they destroyed Arizona, they destroyed Cal, they destroyed Oregon. They beat Washington, they beat UCLA, they beat Notre Dame. And if I'm not mistaken, was in a shootout with Penn State. Yes, and won 52 to 49 in the Rose Bowl. Wow. And this so looking again, yeah, there may be an argument here and there. I think Michigan got too much credit. USC didn't get enough credit. Granted, Michigan lost twice. USC lost three times. But I look at when they lost. USC lost when they're still trying to identify who's the starting quarterback. Michigan lost to a Iowa team by one and lost to their rivals, Ohio State. And that was all at the end of the year when they should have known who they were. And that's not saying, hey, what's going on? Why are they terrible or stuff like that? It's just how it is. But I would love to see an A team. I've seen an example of a 16 team playoff. And quite frankly, 16 teams is a lot of teams. But if you do a 16, I didn't really want to talk about a 16 team playoff, but since I'm still good on time, let's go ahead and dive right on in. So you're looking at the Big Ten, the SEC, the MAC, the, it's not the Big East, the American, the Big 12. Uh, let's start again. The Big Ten, the Big 12. The Pac-12, SEC, MAC, Sunbelt, Mountain West, American, eight. So there's eight. So you look at those eight, and you need another eight. Most, like two of those will easily be independents. Oh man, it's just looking at it that way, 16 is way too many. If we look at 12, so cut out half those at-larges, I think that would be even better. Because you can look at it as, okay, 12. The Big Ten gets a bye. The Big 12 gets a bye. The SEC gets a bye. And the Pac-12 gets a bye. The American gets home field advantage. The MAC gets an advantage, or home field advantage. The Sun Belt gets home field advantage, and Conference USA gets an advantage. I think I'm missing the Mountain West, which that would be five, which then would make a that would leave seven, 
which now we're at three at larges again, which is fine. So you got your five conference champions, you take the highest four, the fifth one gets the fourth one, the remaining at larges get the other three, and you go from there. Now, the biggest thing, again, with anything like the 12 or the 16, now you're cutting into the bowl season a little too much. Eight is doable. You might cut out some of these five and seven teams from making it, but I'm looking at this and I'm just like, I would love to see all the conference champions make a reason to be a, the entire champion. I think the underdog deserves a voice. I think a MAC champion should face a bigger team. But, I mean, again, Wisconsin barely beat Western Michigan. And it was more Western Mich or Wisconsin dominated most of the game, and Western Michigan had a chance to come back. Again, that's just that's once every five years almost. Or once or twice in five years. It's going to be one of the big major conferences who wins the championship every year. But who's to say that a Boise doesn't run the table? Or American team, I'm thinking Louisville right now. But Louisville is actually an ACC team. And... Wow. <laughs> so, let me go over these teams again, because you got the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Pac-12, SEC, ACC, American, MAC, Mountain West, Sunbelt, Conference Users. You got like 10 champions just by that. And now I'm just wondering, wow, what am I even talking about this whole time? I forgot one of the biggest teams, or one of the biggest conferences in the ACC. All right. So let's make sure I got them all now. ACC, American, Big 12, Big 10, Conference USA, MAC, Mountain West, Pac-12, SEC. And Sun Belt, that's my thought. So, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, ten. Which, again, with a 12 format, would work with a 16. Now I can see the argument for a 16. You got your 10 conference champions, the top eight would be have home field. The rest, the other two, and the at-larges would get the rest. Now, you would see a lot more quote-unquote upsets with the at-larges playing like a MAC champion or some belt champion who happens to be higher than someone. Or you could... S it would be interesting. And again, I think eight's the number... With ten, with 10 conferences, it's just not worth it. I apologize to the ACC lovers out there. I don't know why I keep forgetting about them for football, but trust me, I know they're there for basketball as a Duke fan. Uh, in closing, it's just a fun topic to think about. The committee basically came out and said, what, why fix what's not broken? which is what they said about the BCS series, and as you can tell, they did fix it finally. Now comes what will happen next, and I think eight teams will be here sooner than we think. And with that, I'm done with the NCAA football portion. Let's go to the other side, the basketball. So the big changes this week for them was what is considered a quality win. And for a lot of teams, that's been a big question because some teams feel, you know, 
we beat, we win against the right teams. We just lose against the wrong teams. So let's look into this. So here's the definition of a quality win this week by the NCAA. A home win, that's a quality win, is a top 30 team. Okay, that's fine. I can understand that. A neutral win is against a top 50 RPI team. Again, okay, understandable. A top 75 win on the road is also a good win. And again, okay, makes sense. But there's a lot of teams. There's 120 in football and basketball. It's way above that. So let's take a look. So I'm looking at last year's RPI, how it ended. I'm looking at Gonzaga. I'm looking at Cincinnati. I'm looking at SMU, St. Mary's, and any other small conference teams? No, that's it. So that's four small conference teams in the top 25. Okay, and out of those two teams, St. Mary or out of those teams, St. Mary's had five losses. SMU had five losses. Cincinnati had six, and Gonzaga had two. Again, okay, that's hard to compare against. Now, the next section, 26 through 50. VCU starts us off. Wichita State's there. They're looking at North Carolina, Wilmington at 33. Middle Tennessee at 34. Nevada, Dayton, Illinois State, Texas Arlington and Sun Belt. Uh, keep moving down Vermont and the American. Do I consider the Big East a small school for basketball? No, so Seton Hall doesn't really count, but yet again, it's the Big East. They kind of revamped, and they're not as... They're still good in basketball, but that's about it. Uh, Ivy League's Princeton would make 10 small schools just in the 25 to 50 range alone. Now, if you threw in the Big East, you're looking at Creighton, you're looking at Seton Hall, but... I don't consider either of those small, so there's 10. And looking at them, VCU was 26 and 9. Their home record was 15 and 1, neutral 4 and 4, and road was 7 and 4. Okay, Wichita State was 5 and 3 at neutral, 15 and 1 at home, 10 and 1 on the road. Okay. It, 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 what I'm getting at is these teams are supposed to be vulnerable. Like, they shouldn't be vulnerable. And they're not. Now, Xavier at 27, going 24 and 14, that's 14 losses is big. But as a Big East team, not surprising at the same time. Vanderbilt, 19 and 16 at 42. Wow, that's shocking. That's really, really bad. Oh, boy. But, sadly, we're not done. We still have another 25 schools to look at to see what's considered a quality win. Monmouth is 51. That's the first big, big small school. Akron is 55. Why so low? I don't know. New Mexico State. Eastern Tennessee State, Belmont, California State University, Bakersfield, uh, Houston, Central Florida, College of Charleston, Bucknell, uh, we're looking at Colorado State, Boise State, Winthrop, Brigham Young, only because they're in the West Coast Conference. Um, that's it. And I was about to add UNC Asheville, but they're 76. So technically, if you beat them on the road, does not count as a quality win. 
And again, looking at some of these teams, that 74th and 75th is Pittsburgh and Clemson of the ACC. 16 and 17 and 17 and 16. Not very good. But those are the teams, some of these lesser quality teams beat to be ranked higher. Now, if I look at it further, I'm just going to dig down. So Florida Gulf Coast, who won the Atlantic Sun, who was 26 and 8, they were 88th in RPI. They were 0-2 on neutral courts. They were 13-3 at home and 10-3 on the road. Not bad. Not bad at all. They were ranked higher than Ohio State. Ohio State is 17-15. They were terrible. And I will tell you to your face, you were terrible, Ohio State. Now, the team I'm looking for, of course, Ohio. Shocking. I'm looking for my boys. They were... 117th on the RPI. Ouch. They were 20 and 11, though. You want to know who's better than a 20 and 11 Ohio, according to RPI? Georgetown. You know what Georgetown was? 14 and 18. They were beatable. But yet, OU had to be so lowly ranked. And, I mean, it's reflected in the away. The road tally. They're 7-6. They just couldn't win on the road. But we were good. And by good, I mean we could have won the MAC and not let Kent State win the MAC. However, Kent State won. They just didn't do anything with it like some teams have been doing. Now, if I look at all the teams listed here, now you remember I said 120 used to be the number in football. And I do say used to because that's the last I remember the number being. We're looking at basketball and it's 351. That's a lot of schools. And the worst team was Alabama A&M, 2-27. They won a game on the road and they won a home game. How, I do not know. <laughs> But when you think of these schools, it's surprising it's one of the Southwestern schools that are last. Because when I usually think of these schools, I think of a Big West team or someone else usually doing terrible. For example, 348th St. Francis Brooklyn was 4-27. and Now, back on track, we're talking about the RPIs and what it means. Now... It's supposed to judge your competition and weigh how good you are compared to everyone else. So, obviously, the big conferences who get all the recruits are going to be rated higher than a small conference team. But Gonzaga, being 37-2, they got the edge, of course. But number one, North Carolina, because they're a champion. Gonzaga, I'm shocked, was sixth. But, again, this is after the... After the NCAA championship. Now, I'm also looking at a category I didn't mention. There's a non-Division one record against opponent. Right now, I'm seeing a lot of wins. But that's because they're all big schools and typical schools. Now, if I'm looking, I'm sure the lower I go, where do I see my first loss? Because there's got to be some. It's going to probably be, wow, way down here. And it's right there. At 313 is the first loss I see to a non-Division I opponent. And the school is, ooh, let me see. Usually I'm really good at memorizing schools, but California State University Northridge was the first school listed in the RPIs to lose to a non-Division I team. Big West team, they were 11 and 19. 
So again, not doing well. And from there, you start seeing these ones pop up. But even then, you see a lot of undefeated against the non-division ones. So what does this mean for quality wins? This means you got to schedule against these better teams. And essentially, that's what the NCAA wants the better teams to do is schedule the weaker teams. So like a Dayton's going to play a Creighton or a Wichita State or a Xavier or VCU. It's obviously they're going to play VCU because Atlantic 10, but we need, there needs to be more like bigger schools playing the small schools. Now let's look. I now I of course looking up the wrong thing. Realignment. Yes, that's what I want. Now I was looking at the wrong Realignment possibility. I say that because VCU, I thought, is supposed to be moving. So I'm looking at the American Athletic Conference, and they're looking to vamp up their schools. And it's, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm taking a while looking through some of this because it's been since March since I've heard anything about conference realignment. I'm pretty sure Wichita State like Wichita State specifically I think I remember could move and Again, it's just moving to where, and I think it's the American Athletic Conference. Now, what does that mean? Well, you face prestigious teams like UConn, Cincinnati, SMU, those three teams right there are always good at basketball. But if they get Dayton, they get a VCU that's just going to keep vamping up the AAC and right now I'm just trying to see see I don't see any confirmations on it and I'm not surprised now let's look at who currently is in the American Athletic Conference now we know SMU we know Cincinnati Houston was really good last year Central Florida has been good they have a seven foot I'm gonna have to look him up but I'm thinking UCF tall kid <laughs> but they have a very tall basketball player tackle fall he's seven six that's right he's really tall and unlike a lot of others he's got weight on him at 270 so I say he's got weight, but he's still skinny as can be. But last year, he was a very focal point for them. was very good. You just got to watch the obvious foul calls that people are calling, which isn't necessarily fair to him, but he was very good for UCF. Uh, Memphis used to be good. Kentucky took a step back again, but they – I don't know why they haven't been turning it around. Uh, Tulsa's in the league, Temple, East Carolina, Tulane, and South Florida. Now, you look at some of those teams, you think, okay, okay, Conference USA, former Conference USA guys, you got pulled into the football schools of the Big East. And I look at it, and I just, it's weird looking at it. <laughs> in all honesty, it's so weird. Because I'm going to look at the football standings now and I mean it. I'm looking at the NCAA football standings compared to what I'm looking at for basketball and 
Yeah, there's the same scenes, of course. You got yourself Florida Temple, UCF, Cincinnati, Kentucky, East Carolina. Navy's a football school, which gives them the 12 teams. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I count SMU, Cincinnati, Houston, UCF, Memphis, Kentucky, Connecticut, sorry. Tulsa, Temple, East Carolina, Tulane, and South Florida. Yeah, so it's 11 in basketball and 12 in football. With Navy being the 12th in football because of the conference championship that everyone has to do nowadays. Now, if I look, Conference USA, good old Conference USA. None of the teams are right there, but for basketball, if you get a Dayton, you get a VCU, you get a Wichita State. It's just shocking. And let's look. There's five candidates. This was from last season, like last year, 2016, of teams that could move to the actual Big East in basketball, Connecticut, because of what they used to be in the Big East. Dayton, because of a prominent, strong basketball tradition without football. You're looking at St. Louis, who's another team that's in the AAC, uh, Wichita State and VCU. All schools focused on basketball. And quite frankly, that's what the Big East came out and basically said, that's what they want. Now, March 2nd, all right. So this year, March 2nd, I'm looking up this topic. Again, this is stuff that might have been in the back of my mind, might be in the back of your minds, you might have heard it. Now, VCU, Wichita State, Dayton to join the AAC. Now, if I look at those three, you have 11 right now in basketball. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this. You see 11 AAC college programs right now. If you had successful programs, Wichita State, Virginia Commonwealth, and Dayton, you would have 14 teams, and it would be a big, strong league because you would have VCU, Wichita State, Dayton, UConn, Memphis, Cincinnati, SMU, Houston, Temple. And then you got what a lot of people talk about as the lower tier, Tem Tulsa, Eastern Carolina, South Florida, Central Florida, and Tulane. Now, Central Florida has been good, and specifically basketball. Now, yes, Blake Bortles was from Central Florida. They had a good season, but basketball just had, or football just hasn't been there. Now, looking at this conference realignment that could happen, that would be huge, and it would affect the RPI. And quite frankly, conference realignment is such, such a weird thing to keep all eyes. Now, here's an interesting topic. I'm telling you this now. Now, this was from June 27th this year. Save the day, all eyes on 2023 for conference realignment. Six years down the road. Why is that? Everyone's talking realignment, realignment, realignment. Oh, man. And you know why this is a big topic? Back in October of 2016, the Big 12 opened the doors for people who wanted to join a big conference and get them to the 12 teams needed for a conference championship. Now you look at this and I see why did they pick 2023? 
It starts with expiring TV contracts. ACC and SEC both have long-term media rights. But the Big Ten runs till then. The Pac-12 runs basically till then. And the Big 12 runs another year on top of that. But why is this a big deal again? Why is this a topic? Well, in football, BYU could be looking for a group of... They call it the group of five, which is the lesser known teams. So like BYU, Boise State, Houston are looking to be a group of five football heavyweight. Or group of five... Or moving to, oh man, this is bad. But moving to the bigger group. So like the Big 12, Big 10, Pac-12, SEC. ACC, yes. And again, it comes down to money. Everyone wants more money. Everybody wants to join the big teams. But I think if realignment happens, it's going to be the Big 12. Why do I think it's the Big 12? Because they have 10 teams. It was a shocker when Texas A&M left. And it was a shocker when Colorado left. Those two teams were part of the Big 12. One went to the Pac-10, which is now the Pac-12. The other went to the SEC, which was a slap in the face to the Texas football community. In some aspects, of course. Does this change a lot? No, but for realignment, I think you have to look at how it affects teams. A Texas A&M now doesn't have a rivalry really with Texas. A Colorado is now more comfortable in its Pac-12 than in the Big 12. What else happened was Nebraska left, which was really weird also. <laughs> but they did add West Virginia, which if I had to pick a team for the Big 12, it was not West Virginia. But they've done great. They've done what they needed to do to stay relevant. In closing, once again, I greatly will accept comments. Uh, greatly will accept feedback. Um, I know some comments, I don't want to say some comments aren't justifiable, but to understand what's wanting to be accomplished would help. I, again, going to look into fixing this, which you never know what will happen with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to see what else I can dive into for you guys. Uh, bigger segments. I know today it was more college sports, which is fine. I'm not quite ready to do predictions for college, but that could be down the road. Uh, again, please share, like, subscribe. Comment, message, anything. Keep communication open. Uh, Twitter handle. Myra uh, Sports Talk is on SoundCloud. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. And I post on Twitter. I, today I made sure to make a comment of recording now. Especially if people wanted to ask questions, please once again follow. I'll put the Twitter right here, or the Twitter. Listen to me, old guy. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, this past weekend I did get a year older, I guess. Uh, I am now a healthy 28, I guess you could say, but um, it's just funny making fun of my own self for how old I am. But again, Twitter, where to find me on Twitter, I guess, is down here. Um, let's go ahead and please follow. Again, please subscribe. Please like. Uh, 
and please just keep commenting. I love hearing from everyone, and quite frankly, I just like hearing from you guys. And please feel free to keep sharing. I enjoy it. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and oh, and another shout out to Schmoogle House Productions. Uh, and again, their Nightwing episodic series. I don't know if it's going to be in seasons format or anything like that. Uh, I'm just going to call it episodic series until I know exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, they do have a teaser trailer. They do have a Q&A with the lead actor who will be Dick Grayson. And quite frankly, I look forward to hearing from them about everything and one last time, I'm Byro from Byro Sports Talk, and have a wonderful rest of your day. It's amazing, I'm the reason, everybody fired up this evening.